So John Carpenter's Halloween and its initial sequel both had very interesting network television debuts featuring their additional or recut footage. So let's delve into a little bit of the oddities of these TV versions of Halloween. Halloween 2. So 1970's Halloween became such a massive success for director John Carpenter, grossing $70 million on roughly a $320,000 budget, then garnered so much acclaim for a simple but frightening premise, and Carpenter's stylish, suspenseful, and atmospheric direction, backed up by Dean Cundey's subtle brilliant cinematography in our film, the thing just completely made John Carpenter such a major player in so many different regards, after the success he had with Salt Precinct 13, and pushing forward into the fog, and eventually, Escape from New York, but as the slasher movie boom kind of kicked off with Friday the 13th, they were just like churning these things out like as a bodily function, just guarding so much money. Definitely someone coming along wanting to do a sequel to the film that broke the entire thing open in the first place, John Carpenter's Halloween. And there was just a little bit of an entanglement here with producer Erwin Yablins, who did the first film, and Avco Ebbesy, who were doing The Fog and Escape from New York with John Carpenter, and they were going to go off and do Halloween 2 with him, but. Yoblins got into legal battle here to re-secure his rights that he knew he had, so he would take that off over to Universal Pictures and make this entire deal with John Carpenter or anything like that to develop a sequel for them. But Carpenter wasn't interested in directing it, but he kind of got saddled with actually writing the whole thing, and he was having an extremely difficult time coming up with a concept and a story to continue on from the first film. He just couldn't find anything, an interesting hook to get into it, and that's kind of where all the stuff where... Laurie and Michael are brother and sister and stuff like that and you get all this complication stuff where they're entangled for like most of the rest of the end of the franchise here. There's a lot of difficult things he was trying to get off on the whole thing and of course finding a director for the whole thing was a bit of a struggle here and there because they originally gave it to Timely Walsh who was working on the production end of things for all of Carpenter's films at the time and he was interested but he really wasn't interested in the script they developed and of course Erwin Galbins also was not terribly satisfied with the script Carpenter turned in because he felt it was kind of predictable, kind of pedestrian. He just didn't find it was very interesting. He didn't have as much of the subtle brilliance the first film had and how it executed stories. So here and there and everywhere, they kind of ended up with Rick Rosenthal going out as the director of the entire film. And he was kind of trying to approach the film, even though he liked the script, he was still trying to approach the film with a subtlety, kind of a, a slow burn, gradual build to the tension, the atmosphere in the entire film. But a lot of things got changed in production as you looked upon what was happening in the slasher genre at this point in time, post Friday the 13th, and all the much more exploitative type of things, much more gratuitous nudity and sex and gore and violence, stuff like that. So there's kind of an appetite to make Halloween 2 more like those films instead of the actual original Halloween film. So there's a little bit of conflicts here and there, and John Carpenter did end up rewriting things and reshooting certain things when he kind of brought in another editor, Skip Schoolnick, who worked on the TV that we're talking about here and kind of looked at the thing, kind of re-edited it here and there and found out what they really need to add back into it. They kind of make it a little more spicy in some places. So there's some additional scenes added for kind of filling out plot holes, other things added into punch out the body count, the gore effects and stuff like that. So certain things were taken away from Rick Rosenthal after he turned in a director's cut that people weren't completely happy with. So there's a lot of rejiggering things going on here and there. And the whole thing was the fact that Universal was going to be debuting the first Halloween film on NBC at the time, going up to the release of Halloween 2 to tie in with everything like that. And they found out that the original Halloween didn't run long enough to fit into the time slot they had for it to run with the ads and stuff like that. It would come up short. Now, these days, they would just kind of pile in more ads and whatnot and add more ad space. But at the back of the time and whatnot, they, it was kind of the thing where... A lot of films would get extended out for the TV network debuts and stuff like that, like the couple of Superman films with Christopher Reeve. I know that uh, Star Trek The Motion Picture got an extended cut on TV or whatnot, which was usually not approved by the directors or just kind of like the producers kind of expanding the film out. Sometimes it was to fill in even more ad space that made it longer. But in this case, it was just the fact of the film runs too short. We need to extend it out in some way possible. So they actually gave John Carpenter some money and some time in the production of Halloween 2, where you got Jamie Lee Curtis and Donald Pleasance, a few other people available, they kind of go off and shoot some additional scenes to fill out the runtime for like the two hour broadcast or something else like that with all the ads and stuff like that. So 
it adds some interesting things here that do kind of as you're going up to Halloween 2 and you've got this entire hook of the, the brother-sister angle between Michael and Laurie, figure they do something to kind of tie into it. Because like, okay, we'll show some additional scenes that make it seem like there's stuff we may, may, might have cut from the first film because who knows whatever back then, 1981, no one really knows anything. So I mean, unless there's some interview in some magazine somewhere, no one really knows anything about the fact that these weren't cut scenes, these are newly photographed and added scenes to the film. So a lot of the interesting little things in terms of what they added into the new cut of Halloween was after the opening sequence, I got the entire thing from where my young Michael goes off and kills his sister Judith and stuff like that. I cut to a couple years later where there's an interesting type of thing where there's a title card that's been missing from the Screen Factory release of this whole thing on their DVD and Blu-ray releases where we're just present on the Anchor Bay version of it many, many years ago where they kind of like say it's Smith's Grove Sanitarium and the date and stuff like that. It just goes in the entire sequence where really the strength of this, these couple of sequences that we have with Dr. Loomis is the fact that it's Donald Pleasance giving his gravitas to this character right in Halloween 1 mode. Not so much the more amped up, more kind of panicky type of off the handle type of thing he has at the sequels, much more back to that subtle subdued type of performance he had in the first film. And it's the entire thing where he's just kind of talking with the Smith's Grove board here and they're kind of like dismissing his claims and whatnot about Michael being too dangerous and he needs to be put in a maximum security facility. Kind of doing the setup for the scenes we'd get up later on that were in the theatrical cut where he breaks out and stuff like that. Just a little setup of the scenes here and there and just getting a little bit of him going off and talking with Michael saying, oh, you fooled him, Michael, but I know better, better and stuff like that. Subtle foreboding type of things that could build up to where you eventually get in the theatrical cut where they're going off to Smith's Grove with... Marion Chambers and stuff like that to bring Michael to his court hearing, stuff like that. So they're good scenes because Donald Pleasant is giving that great performance, but they're not necessary scenes that really tell you much about the story here. Just kind of things that, again, sp expand out where you can and kind of set things up to some degree or whatnot. But the next scene is right before you got Dr. Wood and Dr. Loomis exiting Smith's Grove and Loomis is going to go off and chase off Michael to Haddonfield. You have Loomis going off and seeing Michael sell and anything like that, his room and whatnot. And you see his sister scrolled out in the back of his door or whatnot. So that's the one thing that kind of subtly sets up where you're going into Halloween 2 and stuff like that. So they kind of like figure, well, we might as well do something that ties into this new red cotton plot to us for having the sequel. Since we're shooting everything at the same time. So a little set of things. So if you like that plot twist in Halloween 2, that kind of adds a little more something, something to it that really has no context in the first film whatsoever. And the only other scene is the fact that they added in this whole thing, just again, a full, full filler padding scene that has Jamie Lee Curtis and PJ Souls and Nancy Loomis kind of talking on the phone about the, her two friends around a bar in this blouse that she has and stuff like that. But of course, Jamie Lee has her hair done up in this entire towel and whatnot because obviously she has a different hairstyle come 1981 than she had in 78. And the boy they, they used in Halloween 2 clearly absolutely was not going to blend seamlessly with the other footage they had and completely let the cat out of the bag that this was a newly shot scene and not shot during the original production or whatnot. So it's a fine scene. It just adds nothing to the entire film. So again, they're just kind of like filler scenes. They're just going to expand out the runtime and not really add anything of too much substance to the entire thing. But the ones with Donald Pleasance as Dr. Loomis do add something to the entire mythos or whatnot or add something to just the dramatic potential of the entire film because he is putting such a great performance there. So Nice things in that regard. It's a nice alternate version of the original film to watch if you're kind of curious and stuff like that. But uh, certainly on the Screen Factory release, they did an, win, win a bit of an extra set. They actually include the original NBC TV broadcast version of it. So it's not widescreen like the other version you've typically have seen before. They actually grabbed it from like an original broadcast tape. So it's pan scanned and they have the original intro and stuff like that. And it does have that original title card on there that's excluded from the widescreen version they've been using. But regards to that, it's nice the fact that you have a proper widescreen version of this, even the standard definition, which can't be said for the TV cut of Halloween 2, because the only version we've seen is a pan scan version, which is good at quality, but it's still pan scan from the cinemascope frame in standard definition. And all the scenes blend in completely seamlessly in terms of quality, it's not splicing from weird quality versions of it. So the fact is, it's a lot of deleted material that's added back into Halloween 2. And it's kind of the closest approximation of kind of what Rosenthal was kind of going for originally. Certainly so, there's a lot of things that are a detriment to this version because they're edited for TV, which means there's a lot of censorship involved. So a lot of the guts of the entire film 
pun intended, what, or, or not, the scares, the gore, stuff like that, the gratuitousness in some places, it's all excised from this version, so it's very badly edited in some places, but it adds in some nice other scenes that are kind of interesting to go over, that kind of adds a little extra substance to the characters and some of the proceedings in the entire film, and slightly moves a few things around here and there. So the first change you'll notice in this version of Halloween 2 is the fact that they moved the opening tile sequence to right after the opening Universal logo instead of waiting for the cold open, the recap, and stuff like that, and here and there everywhere. So, pretty inconsequential, arbitrary change. I just imagine, like, they probably hit, like, a commercial break at some point in time. They'd want to wait, like, opening tile sequence, they'd go to a commercial break. I think that's probably the only reason why I could imagine. But after that, there's actually a positive change here where they fix a piece of continuity because you'll know from the end of the first film, Loomis unloads six rounds into Michael Myers at the end of the film. Well, in the theatrical version of Halloween 2, through some error of editing here where they're splicing the new footage from outside the house, changes to seven shots. TV cut reverts it back to six. It corrects it. So that's a good type of thing that they fix something that should have needed to fix in the first place. You got it right the first time around. After that, there's a, some slightly different dialogue after... Loomis exits the house and stuff like that. He's talking to the neighbor who's talking about, oh, I got trick-or-treated to death tonight. What's going on here? And it's like, you don't know what death is. That's changed. Now the neighbor says something to the fact that was his Halloween prank, and then Loomis just turns and walks away. So that maybe a little bit over the top, slightly corny lines kind of cut out for Loomis here and there, or whatever. But I'm sure it's a bit of an iconic line for some people who are very much strong fans of Halloween too. But moving on from there, the other positive changes I feel for this version is the fact that once you get into the hospital, and since we're cutting out a lot of the stuff that's gore footage and some nudity here and there and everywhere, you got to splice some additional stuff in here to fill back out the runtime. So what they did was add a lot more character beats back in the whole thing, a lot more interaction with different people at the hospital, a lot of the staff. Got more stuff with Jimmy and Lori, some of the nurses in terms of Janet and Karen, a few other people here and there just getting extra scenes here to do develop dynamics between the relationships, to develop a little bit more personality for the characters here before they're going to get off and get slashed and cut up and stabbed here and there and everywhere. So it's one of the criticisms at the time that the film felt a little bit thin, a little bit more kind of cannon fodder filling up the entire screen without having some endearing characters built into the entire thing. Aside from the character Lance gets portrayed in terms of Jimmy, a lot of the other characters felt a little thin, underdeveloped. They didn't have much things to hang your hat on. Especially myself and Steve Frazier, who did a commentary on this a couple of years ago. We definitely brought that up as a criticism that we had for the film. Felt like there's just bodies filling up the entire screen without having a lot of character dynamics or anything built up for them here and there and everywhere. So, getting a few scenes with these characters kind of talking about different things that are going on throughout the course of the film commenting on certain things that are happening with going in Hanfield with the stuff with Michael Myers on the news here and there everywhere it adds certain things into the film there's one very particular scene that happens somewhere around the middle of the film here where is after the entire thing where Ben Trimmer gets burned up and before they actually find out exactly who it was they killed in that scenario got this entire scene where Jimmy comes into Lori and starts talking about oh they got him they killed him or whatnot they killed my Michael Myers or whatnot that sends Laurie into a bit of a hysterical frenzy or whatnot. She, she's pretty much convinced now Michael Myers is the boogeyman. She knows that Loomis shot at him six times and he didn't die. He disappeared in the night and stuff like that. She, so she's very much convinced right now that he is not human. He's very much exactly what Loomis says he is. He's evil incarnate. He's something more than human and that he can't die. So that sends her into this frenzy or whatnot, and that kind of brings all the hospital staff in, trying to calm her and sedate her, and then the power gets cut out. Now, this is all different things that were not given in the theatrical cut. And it, it clears up a lot of things, because without this scene, Thor is suddenly comatose through part way of the, the, the second half of the film, and the entire hospital goes from being brightly lit to being just lit by security lights without any explanation whatsoever. It's a giant plot hole where I don't understand why you would cut this out of the theatrical cut. It just fills in certain plot beats that make sense. But most of the stuff I feel like they're good additions to bring the characters more fully into fruition. Give you a little more fleshed out qualities before they're getting cut up and stuff like that. They give a little more empathy because you can definitely say for a lot of different slasher films they don't take enough time to develop the characters before they're getting cut up and stuff like that. So want to have enough stuff build up so you have some empathy, some endearing charm or something else like that. You can connect with the characters so you can feel the terror when things start happening to them. They're very graphic and stuff like that. So 
But these are good things. I think those are very good qualities to add into our film here. But of course, there's a lot more negatives. The fact, again, you are doing a lot of censorship here. All these kills are getting so wasted. Just like they're so badly edited, cutting around all the little gore things. Some things where you have points of nudity. And some things that just feel like they're just completely pointless. I don't know what the hell you're doing. Because when you got the entire part where Michael's stalking around the neighborhood, he goes into the house for the Elrons, and he goes in and grabs the knife where the, she, Mrs. Elrond's making the ham sandwich and stuff like that. This bizarre edit. The whole thing where they're kind of like trying to cut out the neighbor's kill of Alice and just trying to transplant something onto Mrs. Elrond here where they cut this weird insert shot from later in the film in the hospital to uh, close up of Michael there and add in a scream afterwards as if he killed Elrond's instead of going next door. Just, it's really just not good. It's not a good moment or whatnot. And the fact that you could just have Michael kind of go next door and do that entire thing where he jumps out of frame and just kind of cut there and have maybe something else go on. You didn't have to actually show anything, but you could still maintain that and just cut out the the graphic end of that thing. I think that would have worked much better. So this weird slapdash patchwork type of thing you're doing with this entire sequence here. I don't understand it whatsoever. It makes no sense whatsoever. But uh, since you're cutting out a lot, a lot, a lot of footage here, you're also losing a lot of different music cues. A lot of the singers you have from Alan Haworth and John Carpenter here are getting lost completely. They're not being repurposed anywhere in the scene. So it's like you have these entire like kill scenes that are just like played completely silent. So you don't have any of those dramatic points or whatnot in the music. They can have highlight things here and there. So it's badly done. And then there's some points where like other sound effects and other music cues are kind of repurposed in different places here and there. It's weird, arbitrary type of things. People slapping things together in different places. I don't know what the hell is going on. But then they kind of do some similar things where like you got Lori being cut out on the stretcher and then they splice in a shot when she's already in the actual ambulance but they cut back to being carted out. I don't know what the hell anyone's doing here. You're adding weird insert shots that have no purpose to be edited. You're not cutting around anything that needs to be cut around. And then there's the thing where Mr. Gare's going off and he's kind of investigating things on the security camera and stuff like that. And you got these extra shots from taken from sequences later in the film where like Michael's walking down the staircase and various other things. He's walking through the hospital. Kind of like st trying to stretch out a little bit of the, I don't know, a building tension or whatnot. Like, okay, Michael's stalking him going forward and here and there and everywhere. It's like, there's no purpose to it. You're just trying to add in a few extra seconds here and there and I'm, I'm just padding and whatnot. It's like, I don't know. It's just obvious that you cut this stuff from later sequences in the film and just slapped it here. So... It's not really good in that regard. It feels like a, in some places, it feels like a bit of an amateurish fan edit with how they're kind of cut around different things. They're trying to repurpose certain things. Like you can see how you're trying to recontextualize certain things or kind of realize things to a different way or trying to repurpose certain things here and there. It doesn't all really work. And it's kind of obvious what you're doing. It's like, yeah, we, we already know what this sequence is supposed to be. And you're trying to like do it in a different type of way or something else like that. And there are two other particular cuts here. One is the gore cut because they cut a lot of the stuff with the kid with the razor blade and the gums type of thing because it was very bloody and stuff like that. And producer Dino De Laurentiis, who was handling all the international rights to the entire film, did not like that in the film. So that was cut out the TV version. And later on in the film, when Michael goes into Laurie's room and in the theatrical cut, he kind of stabs the pillow, the bed and whatnot a couple of times with a scalpel. Well, in the TV version, they just cut all that stuff out and just have him pull the sheet and walk out of the room. So it's like just very weird type of things like there's not a gore scene whatsoever just like you just cut out stuff for no reason whatsoever on this entire film and there are a number of scenes that got kind of shuffled around here for example with the theatrical cut after you get back from the opening tile sequence it's michael roaming around the neighborhood goes in the elrod house goes over to alice's house kills her then we move into the emts and the police showing up the doyle house you got Lori getting carred off taken to the hospital and you're in the hospital scene getting her prepped and stuff like that and they got the entire thing with Bracket and Loomis and killing Ben Tramer, sadly. In the TV cut, they moved the Elrod scene all the way to the end of that sequence of events. So it goes off with Loomis running out of the Doyle house, then everyone shows up at the Doyle house, and Luke carts Laurie off to the hospital, then you have the entire Ben Tramer scene, then you have everything going off with the Elrod house with the L scene excised. And in that scene where Laurie's initially brought to the hospital, all the close-up insert shots of the needle going into her arm are removed, but there is additional footage at the end where the nurses start undressing her to put her into her hospital gown. And there's also a little something later on where they're at the schoolhouse, Marion Chambers shows up, and then 
in the theatrical cut, you cut back to the hospital for a good length of time, then it's the pick up the whole thing where Mary Chamber is going off with the marshal and stuff like that, and they're taking him off back to Smith's Grove. Well, in the TV cut, it goes directly from Marion Chambers and Dr. Loomis in the schoolhouse directly to the, being scored out with the marshal to the car to be taken back to Smith's Grove. But one of the interesting things, like they, this, the, the sequence where you have Bud and Karen in the entire therapy hot tub, has both footage added and footage cut and some alternate footage because it starts out earlier in the sequence where she actually walks into the whole thing and talks with Bud and then goes in to change. Where in the theatrical, it just starts with her in the room, kind of changing behind the frosted glass or whatnot. But of course, later on, they kind of cut all the stuff out where she's being dunked in the entire thing over and over again. And of course, her breasts or whatnot come out at the end of the sequence here. But they only have Michael kind of dunk her one time, and that's it. But there's actually alternate footage of when Michael's behind her and kind of making kind of seem like maybe he's butt or whatnot, and she's kissing the hand and kissing and stuff like that. Why, why the case was here and there and everywhere. I don't know. People just slap the things together as they choose. But anything, anywhere in that is just the fact that when you get into more of these kills, someone get completely cut out. Like Dr. Mixture, his, his reveal of his death is not even in the TV cut whatsoever. Because when you get that thing where you got Jill going in the whole thing and then she gets stabbed with a needle in the eye, that's all gone. It's completely gone. It's not even present whatsoever. And then you got the entire thing where reveal of Mrs. Al's body, the head nurse. Is tied up with how they kind of start recutting Jimmy's footage in the last part of the entire film here because in the theatrical cut, it's another thing where he ends up going through the entire hospital looking for people because everyone seems to have disappeared and he walks in the entire thing where she's been draining blood and the blood's all over the floor and he slips and falls and hits his head and eventually he go and tries to walk out in the, the entire parking lot and go into his car but he's obviously very dazed probably from like a concussion or something else like that and he kind of barely notices that Lori's there crouched down in the car and he falls over in the, in the horn or whatnot and that facilitates Lori trying to exit the vehicle to avoid drawing attention to herself in that regard. And this one is, is very strange because the entire thing is like, okay, now it's recut where Jimmy's kind of like in the third act. He's just kind of roaming around the hospital trying to find people, but he never actually finds anyone. So we never get, you don't get the slip and fall until much later on the whole thing where they repurpose that for a reaction to when Loomis sets off the fire, the explosion, as if the explosion knocks him on his ass and stuff like that. So him going off in the parking lot, going to the car and the entire falling on the horn, facilitating Lori leaving the entire car is not in the TV version. So Lori's there and crawls into the car and then like a minute later, she just crawls out of the car with no motivation whatsoever to be doing that. Because as far as this edit of the film is concerned, she's in a completely secure, hidden place. There's no motivation for her to leave the car in this cut of the film. And the other thing is the fact that there's an alternate ending. Because after Lloyd's being carted out at the end of the entire film, when the kind of smoke is clearing and stuff like that, and she gets put in the ambulance, Rosenthal was trying to do this sort of like last jump scare type of thing in the film where like, where someone sits up with a cloth over him in the ambulance and thinking maybe it's Michael or whatnot, you're scared. Because that's how Jamie Lee Curtis plays this entire scene, but as it's executed, as it's edited, I don't feel it's a very effective type of thing. It doesn't function the way it's presented in this edit. It's not very good. But the fact of the matter is, getting Jimmy and Lori to kind of reconnect to the whole thing, and then she has emotional outpouring saying we've made it and stuff like that. So it's a payoff to that relationship between those two characters. Because in the theatrical cut, it was maybe a little ambiguous. Because yeah, he slipped and fell, but he made it all the way out to the, the parking lot and he just kind of falls and passes out. Doesn't feel like he's really dead any type of way because he didn't really get stabbed or anything like that or slashed. He just feels like he passed out from the, the knock on the head and stuff like that. So, at least they have that sort of tie off with those two characters because I feel that's a very good thing. And it's the prevailing theory that Jimmy here is the father of Jamie Lloyd, Daniel Harris's character in Halloween 4 and 5, of course. The recast version of her in Halloween 6 or whatnot, because in our commentary for Halloween 4, I thought his name was Jimmy Lloyd. That was me just making a hypothesis or whatnot. It wasn't act, his last name is never actually said in Halloween 2, so I made a jump to a conclusion there that wasn't substantiated by the evidence offered there, but it's a prevailing theory that the two of them from that TV cut is probably the two of them getting together, having a kid, and then of course both of them perish by the end of Halloween 4. And you go off in that timeline with that set of circumstances, stuff like that. So here and there never. So that's a nice type of thing to go off in that regard. But 
A lot of the other stuff in this version are just like, it's badly edited stuff. There's just really jarring edits. We got certain things like, okay, when the nurse Jill comes out in the hallway and she sees Lori there in this sort of dazed state of whatnot, and then Michael comes up behind Jill and she gets stabbed with a scalpel and whatnot. In this version, since they're cutting out all this gratuitous type of stuff, it's like, it just seems like he get, she just gets lifted up from behind and never, never actually see what actually happens to her. And the thing with the, the marshal and whatnot that came to collect Loomis or whatnot, and they get, go back to the hospital and whatnot, his death is completely different with alternate footage because in the theatrical cut, Michael kind of sits up and he kind of grabs him. They're kind of wrestling around in here and there and he gets slit across the throat. In the TV cut, it's, again, it's a jarring edit and whatnot, but it's different footage where it's like, okay, now Michael gets up behind the marshal and whatnot, the sheriff, and it seems like either he gets stabbed through the back or he actually gets shot through the chest or whatnot. It's because like, it looks like there's like a squib on his chest, but it seems like he got stabbed or whatnot. It's a very bad edit, whatever it is. Whatever's happening here, it's not clear and it's badly executed. And there's a smattering of alternate footage and alternate dialogue all over this entire edit of Halloween 2 that's pretty arbitrary and not very consequential to such a degree, but Editor's Kids Goldnick did do the TV edits of Halloween and Halloween 2 and mainly did TV movies and TV series as an editor going forward in his career, but he did become the producer on the David Boreanaz led series Angel later on, so kind of a big thing for him. But looking at this entire thing, it's like, I know you got kind of a lot of this graphic, gratuitous type of stuff, and it seems kind of a weird type of thing. Like, okay, maybe you just didn't have enough footage to kind of work with to kind of re-edit it, but even then, it's still very, very bad. So it seems like you just chopped things out and didn't try to take the other available footage, kind of wrap it around in some other way, or kind of still like not cut out all these musical stingers that kind of add something to the entire context of the entire film here. This feels kind of weird. It feels kind of slapdashed, haphazard to such a degree. And it feels like you would think that we're doing this entire TV, edit, the first film, we're actually shooting additional footage to kind of fill out the entire thing. You think someone would kind of think forward to the TV end of Halloween 2 and they're going to debut at some point in time and maybe shoot some alternate footage to kind of work around some of the more gratuitous type of stuff that you're doing for the theatrical version? Clearly, no one was. I feel like there's a fuller version of this film that could exist if you had all the available footage to recontextualize everything, reassemble it, and have some more character in it, a little more personality, while still maintaining all the great sort of gore stuff and the gratuitous stuff you got going on there. Even though, like I said, there are certain scenes that John Carpenter shot himself that weren't Rosenthal's doing, but they still probably add something into the pacing and the clip of how often you get something horror-related in the entire film here. So there's certain qualities of this version of the film that are admirable, but there's a lot of just really negative things because of the inherent nature that it is something for network television broadcast that you just can't get away with anything worth a damn that you can get away with with an R-rated film in a theater. So the fact that both of these TVs are completely available on the screen for releases, every DVD, every Blu-ray version they put out, they all have that version of each film available easily. So very different from a lot of the stuff I've talked about in the retro video series was like, oh, this thing's already available on like a VHS or some laser or some weird obscure type of thing that's not really available on current formats. These are very easy to find. A lot of people have watched it, but I felt like it's an interesting type of thing. I know there's alternate versions of H2O. There's a work print version and there's also a TV broadcast version that I do not have available to myself right now, but maybe in the future if I ever grab a hold of them, Maybe I can talk about them as well, but of course the Halloween 6 debacle with the theatrical and the producer's cut has been very well documented. I put a lot of talk into it in my old review for the film. We did talk about it a little bit in our commentary for it a couple of years ago as well. So definitely stuff for you to check out if you're a little more interested on those fronts. But these were kind of interesting sort of oddities or whatnot that can talk about in the lexicon of the Halloween franchise, which I've never really covered in this depth before on this channel. So interesting things in that regard, so guys. Hit comments below, tell me what you think about these two different versions. If you really, if you like those extra scenes for the first Halloween, they kind of add something in there. If you kind of just kind of like seeing that longer version of the first film. And tell me what you think about some of those positive and negatives of the TV version of Halloween 2 so much. And if you have anything to say about the HBO versions, definitely let me know a preview of what I could expect if I ever find those versions available to watch and stuff like that. So... People kind of were hoping that would be a, in, in, included on the HGO 4K edition, but it was not. They just kind of recycled all the same features, but anything like that. So, guys, let me know about that stuff. 
please hit the like button. That really does help the channel to get that interaction and that kind of feeds the algorithm, make sure the entire thing gets out to different people and we get more people involved with being watching the channel and stuff like that. Of course, if you want to keep up with everything that we got going on in the entire channel, definitely hit the, subscri hit the subscribe button. And you can follow us on social media. You can follow me on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, stuff like that. So all the links are always in the descriptions of every single video here. Look it all up and connect with me on all the different things. And guys, thanks so much for watching, engaging with this entire thing. So we'll be back with more great stuff soon. So thanks so much. Take care. Bye-bye.